So I'd like to start with a land acknowledgement. The Port Townsend Writers Conference, of which Centrum is a part, and also the North Wind Arts Reading Series is located on the land and waters of the traditional territory of the Slalom and the Chimicum people. Centrum and the Port Townsend Writers Conference and North Wind Arts all strive to honor the Salish Coast people's thriving culture and their efforts to sustain their homelands. So just a few other quick announcements before we get started. I'd like to thank my co-curators of the Northwind Reading Series, Linda Robertson, who you'll meet soon, and um, Sheila Bender is also here tonight. So we're thrilled to be celebrating both Earth Day today and National Poetry Month with this reading by three local poets who all write beautifully and powerfully on behalf of the Earth. Rob Lewis from Squamish Island, Ann Spears from Vashon Island, and Cedar Saigo from Suquamish. So here's the format for tonight. After a brief introduction, each reader will read for 15 minutes, and then we'll have a discussion. And between the readers and the two moderators, Linda and myself. So Rob is going to lead us off. He is a poet, a writer, an activist, and a house painter working to bring the power of language to the defense of the more than human world. His writings have been published in Dark Mountain, Cascadia Weekly, Manzanita, The Atlanta Review, Southern Review, and others. As the owner of Earthcraft Painting, he also works to revive the use of local wild clays to paint our work and living spaces. So please welcome Rob Lewis. Thanks, Holly. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming out on this gorgeous day. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm looking forward to hearing from Anne and Cedar. I've just been able to communicate with you guys by email, so this will be great. Um, I love the topic, you know, poetry and nature. It sounds like a really simple, straightforward topic, but it really isn't. Uh, and I, I really am getting, starting to feel more and more that our culture right now needs poets uh, in this climate fight and in order to try to save the biosphere. Uh, and I've been thinking about it for a while. Um, it really kind of was um, what generated um, the first essay in, in the book, uh, The Silence of Vanishing Things, which Holly mentioned. I had uh, been looking through the poet's market uh, which is what, you know, you look through if you want to see what the poetry guidelines are for various publications out there. They list a blurb, tell what their kind of poetry they're looking for and not looking for, and they call them submission guidelines. And I kept noticing the phrase, um, no nature poems, please. And that really struck me. And uh, this was the mid-90s, and uh, globalization was uh, really going great guns around the world. Uh, lots of forests were falling, lots of industrial ag was developing. So that just struck me. Um, and so it, it got me uh, working on this essay. And, um, you know, one of, the, one of the questions that came up was, you know, well, what is a nature poem? You know, and, and how do you divide between what a nature poem is and what a non-nature poem is? And, um, how do you even, you know, just right now we're all using technology. It doesn't seem like nature, yet nature provides all the circuitry, all the, all the minerals, um, the silicon chips are made of quartz, you know, so there is no getting away from nature. And I'm just going to read a section uh, from this essay about that. A few weeks after my encounter with the Poets Market, I was on a Greyhound bus on my way to Denver. It was night. Our darkened tunnel with its hooded aisle lights raced through an even darker tunnel of highway. I looked around at the tilting, bobbing heads and thought, I could write it now, the non-nature poem, that is. There we were, humanly, encapsulated in a machine, the world outside our windows, hidden by night, indecipher indecipherable. No nature in there, right? But someone must have had an apple in their bag, which was filling the cabin with the sweet tang of an apple orchard. And there was the watery chorus of our own breathing. And with the watery, with that, the watery reminder 
of our reciprocal intimacy with plants. Our craft was built with steel dug from mountains, fueled by the compressed and composed residue of ancient life layered on ancient life. Our wheels were round the signature shape of nature. And we were rolling on a planet toward a sun. Out my window, a thin line of red appeared on the horizon, as if it had been slipped and risen with blood. Milky pools of mist hung in the folds of a pasture. The bus banked a long curve, and through the shoulders of two hills, a shaft of light found a chestnut mare standing alone in the field, igniting in the haze around her a halo of rainbow luminescence. So there really is no writing nature poems and non-nature poems. You know, we are where we are, and that's on Earth. Uh, there's nowhere else we can really be unless you want to go to Mars <laughs> and join Jeff Bezos and those guys. Um, and when I got to Denver, uh, I went over to Tattered Cover Books. I don't know if anybody's ever been there, but if you go to Denver, you have to go to Tattered Covers. It's a huge and glorious bookstore. And I decided to just check out the poetry stacks and see how this theme of no nature poems was playing there. And and it was the same experience, really. I, I, I really couldn't find any poems uh, that had to do with the ecological situation at that time. And I found that kind of distressing, but um, I also noticed just how categorized a bookstore is. You know, you have the environmental section, you have the poetry section, you have the race car section, you have the woodcraft section. You know, we've been categorized into silos. And um, I came to see that as, as more the issue than uh, scientific uh, poets not engaging with an issue, or at least these publishers not printing their work. Uh, the problem, you know, that I get into is that has, you know, carries the, the ought and the should. And whenever uh, you start mixing art up with oughts and shoulds, you're running into trouble. So it, it really is a complicated thing how we, how we stay true to ourselves as artists um, while at the same time staying human as people on the earth. Um, I'm going to read a poem that kind of came out of that experience uh, at Tattered Covers. It's called, I Went Looking for the Wild One. I went looking for the wild one, the howler, the Vatic tramp, the one for whom the wounded hillsides are inner burns, whose blood is stained with the old love wine of poet and earth, warrior poet slinging battle flack out at the static, shattering polite conversations everywhere. I looked in the anthologies, listening for echoes, traced for signs in the quarterlies, magazines, best ofs. I learned it's been a good year for poetry. Grants and awards coming in, contests and prizes proliferating. The wise gray consensus councils are returned to the classics. Meanwhile, poor scientist holds extinction in a poem full of numbers with nothing but data to howl with. And uh, that gets up to, that gets to the categorization issue again. You know, um, in some ways, I guess that poem was a was a criticism of maybe what's felt to me a disengagement uh, by the poetry world with nature. But really, I think what I was seeing was the uh, categorization we all get into, how um, we've taken the environment and we've put it under the category science. So scientists are left with this job of trying to save and manage you know, what's left of ecosystems, but they don't have the language for it. Um, and science is very much uh, still in the frame and the mold of mechanical thinking. Uh, we see this in the climate uh, science. Uh, I began to learn more about climate and began to realize that uh, the story we're getting about climate is actually fairly limited. Um, uh, if you look at the IPCC reports, the Interna Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 
their assessment reports are all, all amended by the phrase, the physical science basis. So uh, there's, there's two branches of science, the physical science and the life science, biology and physics. And the story we have about climate is pure physics. And um, for various reasons, it's complex, but mostly I think because of a mechanical bias in human culture and in scientific culture, we've taken this physical basis. It's also the one that you can run computer models on. Uh, you can't model uh, living systems. They're just too complex. What happens in soil, what happens between uh, trees and clouds and the movement of moisture and, and temperature and uh, energy, uh, we don't have the skills yet to, to be able to put that into a model. It's almost impossible because it's changing constantly and models work with things that are supposed to be constant. So um, I've come to realize that there's a side to the climate that we're not even getting and that's the biological climate, it's ecosystems. This, this climate that we think exists purely in the atmosphere and is purely moderated by carbon dioxide is actually the production of the living earth. It's the production of Gaia, just the way Gaia makes clean water, uh, the way Gaia makes oxygen. Uh, Gaia also makes climate. So when we destroy ecosystems, when we ruin soil with uh, agricultural, uh, industrial ag, and when we cut down forests and, and cover up land, we are causing climate change. And we are causing, uh, and, and these effects have been well known for a long time, uh, but we're not getting told. And uh, it's a bit upsetting to me. Um, and I guess to, to bring it back to poetry, um, what I've discussed, you know, what you find when you look at climate through this biological lens is you find yourself running out of words and turning to poetry because it's so uh, immense and beautiful and subtle and full of grace how this climate works and how this planet creates climate um, that you find yourself uh, moving from the scientific mind to the poetic mind um, and in fact a lot of these scientists end up using poetic metaphors when they're describing uh, this, this biological climate. So uh, I'm, I'm really hoping that um, poets will, will, will take the time to try to learn this science and understand it and begin to speak for it because um, we can't rely on the climate movement to do that. They're too invested in the physical narrative. They're too invested in all the jobs and technology. Um, but we really are not going to be able to uh, get out of this climate fix without restoring and, and repairing the earth. Uh, and what's exciting there is, is um, we have, we've, we've done so much damage to this planet. Uh, to the tune of billions of acres. Most of the deserts uh, on Earth are man-made. Um, most of the grasslands have been utterly ruined. And over the last couple of decades, scientists and biologists and just regular folk, farmers, uh, permaculturists, they've been uh, learning how nature sequesters carbon, how uh, grassland ecosystems work. So for example, if you just switch grazing from sending your cattle out to just roam the land and you bunch them up and move them around as though they were uh, wild herds uh, behaving the way they used to when there were predators around and they would, you know, bunch up for safety and they would move a lot because they were, you know, uh, devouring all the, the grass and they were pooping and peeing on it and, and they had to move on. But what they did while they were devouring that grass and pooping and peeing and, and trampling it in, they are providing um, the microbiome in their gut that the soil doesn't have by its own so that the soil is able to, um, the grassland ecosystem is able to function the way it's intended to. You know, the grasslands need large animals. You know, ideally it would be uh, buffalo, 
and uh, antelope. But if we can move cattle in the same way and restore all these grasslands, uh, we could we could uh, sequester so much carbon. Uh, it just dwarfs what we're talking about with technology. And again, no one hears about it because uh, it's just it's not the way the culture is headed right now. So anyways, I'm, I'm just going to finish with um, more on this idea of nature and uh, poetry and nature and the role of poets in uh, climate and ecology. Uh, this is the last bit of uh, my essay, The Silence of Vanishing, or um, uh, No Nature Poems, Please. Society needs the poet right now. It is an age of irony and reversals, and this is one of them. If we have forgotten what air is, have lost the sight of this divine formula, plant and animal breathing life into each other, who but the poets remind us? If we have lost our enchantment with nature, who but the poet to re-enchant us, to retune our senses to nature's hidden energies and mysteries, for every scientific explanation of nature, there is a poetic explanation. And it's the poetic explanation we most need now. The practice of poetry brings certain standards, a deeper intensity of observation, the freedom to see the sacred anywhere and everywhere, the courage of heart seeing, the determination to make words meet their subjects with fidelity, with fidelity and power, useful qualities for a craft viewed as having no practical use. But it's just not human society that needs the poet. It's societies of birds and reptiles, forests and coral reefs. Nature, slowly collapsing into silence, calls out louder than ever for the poet. Now we all need what the poet brings, the broken open hearts of words, the wild articulation, the howl. So I don't know where I am with my 15 minutes, but. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Rob. Yeah, no, that was great. You know, when we made up the order, I thought my instinct said to start with you and you just provided such rich tech context for us. And I know we're going to come back to so. a lot of those ideas that you mentioned about um, poetry and science and me the mechanistic universe and we'll we'll come back to that in the discussion for sure and Great. thank you for ending on the the poem and the especially the line who but the poets will remind us so i'm so glad we have two more poets to hear tonight um so linda is going to introduce our next poet ann spears so Ann Spears is the inaugural Poet Laureate of Vashon Island. She served as Vashon Audubon President as the Land Trust staff overseeing volunteer stewards and compiling property baselines. She is co-writer of Walks, Trails, and Parks on Vashon Island and stewards the Vashon Poetry Post. Her 2021 poetry publications include Rain Violent, uh, published by Empty Bowl, Back Cut by Black Heron and Harpoon Ravenna Triple Series. And she has a website, annspears.com. So thank you, Ann, for sharing your work with us tonight. Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. And I'd like to um, start by acknowledging that Vashon Island is the indigenous lands of the Schwabach people. Um, also known as the Swiftwater, now aligned with the Puyallup. And I want all their spirits, as Chief Self said, who walk our trails, and we have miles of trails. Um, we are a group also of, see ourselves as islanders, and with the Land Trust, Audubon, um, Bashan Nature Center, um, small groups, large groups, we are trying to preserve and conserve where you now walk as spirits. Um, also King County helps us. We have the most unrocked, un, uh, bulkheaded shoreline in King County. 
So I want to start where what poets do, which is describe, and I slowly work into a soft criticism of curiosity and science. Things fall apart. Shy Shy Trail. On our return, we eat amid a surfeit of salal berries. Purple ink, skins, sticky, pitchy, spaced on a stem. Satiated, our appetite slides to curiosity. We finger open the berry, seed triparted, like the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. A spider minute, muddling ripe flesh, picking out space within, lifts its articulated legs against our nails, opening its nursery. A worm, minute, excuse me, a worm, white, segmented, eye dot, contracts its length, curves upward, its head swaying against our probing. We've consumed more than berries. We eat God's creatures, each in the berry to deposit larva. And those soft things feed off the swash of sweet. They harden, emerge, arachne herself, or wings unfolding. We hear the center cannot hold. Our world disordered at our sundering, the berry, our vast appetite, our curiosity. This is part of a chapbook um, concerning when I went down to Baja, uh, Mexico to visit the gray whale um, birthing ponds. And my grandfather whaled commercially out of Westport in the, in the 1920s. In the Reserva de la Biofera, El Viscano, the Yankee and local guides huddle, drinking something straight and strong. I can smell that gringo across the room, an absence of scent, not wood burning or creosote bush or axle grease. I bet his wife is thinner than I am. I heard on public radio that celibacy for priests is not necessary for pastoral efficiency or personal wholeness. This assertion coming now panics me. Two, hung on a shrub, the carcass shines, red flesh marbled with fat and gripped by sinew. The great horn sheep's four hooves gather to a point. Where are the viscera and backbone? Where is the trophy? The curled horn, skull, lips, and ears, packaged to be carried north to the taxidermist. Three, the hunting guide talks Spanish at me. All I can muster are the words, cervezas, por favor. No cervezas arrive. Perhaps we shouldn't be here. I respond, see, sí, to all he says. I found that repeating, see, sí, yes, see, sí, is the quickest ticket for an exit. Back on the road, descending the flanks of Trevor Henney's volcano, David advises that saying yes in another's tongue is a dangerous habit. My next is a poem in a book coming out in September called Back Cut by Black Heron Press. And um, these poems detail the edge of Washington State immediately after World War II and after the forest big cut and last commercial razor clam digs. In that decade, folks act out a living on the dwindling supply of these natural resources. The poems are a series of monologues between a husband who is a vet and a wife who is emotionally adrift. It's a love story. This is in the wife's voice. Methuselah's beard. One, old man Samson straightens his flannel shirt, faded to gray, cigarette behind his ear, face stubble long as it will get. He stands in the bright color of cedar shakes, freshly split day in and day out. He waves his arm, a generous invite to go at it ourselves, split our own shakes, or leave some coins, nickel per piece, honor system. I run a U shake, he jokes. The old coot shows off, his fro cleaves the wood, he twists its half, iron splitting shakes from the bolt's fresh edge. 
too. My husband picks up the tools, tries a hit in another, the split not clean, the length short of the 24 inches allowing 10 inches to the weather. Samson says, it's the drinking, you gotta give it up. My life, my love answers, not on your life. Stuffs a few dollars into the coffee can atop a stump. He shoulders his bundles of shakes, plenty to roof half a shed. Three, my love, yes. No one does as much weight, lift and set down, moving cedar dugouts up beach, pry and push his long handled PV wrangling logs into place. St. Christopher himself, carrying over streams, fast and frothy, white ladies, heavy with larded pies, native women, plump with a fry bread, dipped in seal oil, everybody laughing. My drunken man, flexing, noise, show off. Four, we buck down the road, I say, old man Samson knows what he is about. I hang my arm out the window, my fingers combing the dismal light. We roll through the woods, hung with Methuselah's beard, a lichen so proficient it eats the air. I say, I don't mind being here, the smell of cedar holding me. My love downshifts, the high pitch of metal on metal, break smoking, indecent thoughts rise in me about old man Samson undressed, he all white under his stiff clothes, except for his hands and face, sun leathered and work cut, tough as a scabby apple. I pull my hand in from the rushing air. It finds its mate as I slide them between my legs, my desire taking me somewhere else. Um, it's been a rich world uh, year for publishing for me. I also have um, Empty Bowl putting out a book of quatrains and each quatrain has a international weather symbol. And Bolinas Frank took the weather symbols, which since 18, um, 1850s about have been put on local weather charts by now today, thousands and thousands of backyard weather stations, um, boats. So um, I put the different symbols in their title and then I had four lines of poetry and I'll show you two of them. Let's see here. This is um, rain violent. The little dots are the rain. And then the other one is Drizzle, not freezing. So, I'm going to get backwards for you. Oh, well. Okay. Well, here's some of the poems. Weather station on top of a mountain. Ants stream like red monks, lining up to collect sweet from whatever heat rises and from everything tongue pretty with nectar in winter slip into warming. Rain slight. First we take Manhattan, then Berlin. Maybe Bangkok or Dubai. We infect you. We swarming, our genes a kaleidoscope, twisting faster than your magnifying eye. Rain continuous. I wear rain gear always. Some of us go naked, cycling through the market. Everyone wears shower caps, crinkling over coiled hair. Mirage. Out of the scrub, children in red t-shirts run chasing America like a soccer ball. Border guns collect boys with little sisters. Mama said, walk north, night. Star bright. Rain violent. They on the shore are not us. In the rain, they set their boats on fire. 
Wood ignites the plastic smoke, black and acrid. To slake thirst, they open their mouths, faces up. Snowflakes continues. We melted snow. Yes, we drank ice worms, red threads in our camp cups. Yes, our breath formed small clouds. Yes, glaciers opened for us, crevasses moaning. Drizzle not freezing. The moon's ragged edge rasps dusk. We walk out into the field of wet, our garden's last cut, mint or cane or nettle, grief in every handful. Snow crystals starlike, out of the boat, kindness steps. She is pregnant, full. She has done this before, stepping out of boats, rocking, finding balance, grasping the bird's tail. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anne. That was wonderful. I love how your reading adds another whole dimension to what Rob shared with us and, and in learning about the people who work the land and um, the, their voices and so many wonderful details too. And and I have to say, congratulations on a prolific year. <laughs> yeah, and just to let everybody know, we did, we're did. we going to post, we're posting the bios in the chat. And so if you want to um, look into these books that our poets are reading from, um, Anne just read from Bat Cut, which is coming out from Black Heron, or I'm sorry, yeah, from Black Heron. And then Rain Violent will be coming out from Empty Bowl and a third one, Harpoon. And her website is also there too. So you can find more information. Yeah. So thank you so much, Anne. And, and I'll go ahead and introduce our final poet, um, Cedar Saigo. And after that, we will be moving into discussion. So feel free to start posting questions in the chat as they occur to you. Okay, it's great, a great honor and pleasure to introduce Cedar Psycho. I'm so glad he's able to join us tonight. Cedar was raised on the Suquamish Reservation in the Pacific Northwest, which is also the community where I am very grateful to be living, the community of Indianola. We are on Suquamish land. He is currently a mentor in the MFA program at the Institute of American Indian Arts. A book of lectures guards the Mysteries will be published by Wave Books in June of 2021. So another book to look forward to. And we will um, we'll post the link for you to, um, if you're interested in that book, I'll post that in the chat as well. So please welcome Cedar Saigo. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Holly. And I also want to thank uh, Rob and Anne and also to Centrum and to North Wind. Um, tonight, I think I just had this chapbook come out um, from Milwaukee. My friends Michael Slozik and Luke Daly put this together. And it's just 125 copies. And uh, the unifying factor behind this book is that it's all poems uh, concerning the poet Joanne Kiger. And it's called On the Way. And um, Joanne Kiger um, is largely a Northern California poet. Uh, she was born in 1934 and died fairly recently in 2017. Actually, I saw one of Joanne's friends is here, Paul Nelson, um, who also wrote a book of poems um, about Joanne Kiger. Um, but I thought she would be a good person to concentrate on for Earth Day because her poetry is very concerned with nature. Um, not so much entire constructs and ecosystems as much as how differences in nature show up in daily life. Um, and she was very intent on dating things. Um, if she was writing while traveling, taking notation of that. And um, she was also married to the poet Gary Snyder. 
and lived with him for four years in Japan. But often I feel almost too much is made of that fact. And it almost obscures her legend at times. Um, so I'm going to read from this book called On the Way. And this first poem I'll read is... Um, she made some experimental videos in the late 60s. And I watched one of these videos after she had died. And um, I just started scribing the words that she was saying. And this poem happened. Um, and this is, I didn't really alter the order of the words. They were sort of as received during the film. Once upon a time, I was speaking and he was speaking and the poem was speaking. Thank you for the ground it gives us, gives us a place to be. I was speaking and you were speaking and the poem was speaking, gives us a place to be. Thank you for the ground it gives us. November 19th, 2016 for Joanne Kiger. One, Poetry is the part that no one sees. Clip the flower, burn the brush, watch rain stream down the moon viewing window. Six drops fold together, then glimmer. Burn a stick of autumn leaves, crack the screen door, write longer, have beams shooting out and over the blessed bountiful body. Do not revisit poems the next day, they have already rejoined the actual matter, daily music fallen back into the fabric. To acknowledge mastery would violate her flexibility, even further terms, the heat and shape of the mountain. Two, bring the outside in, the gray continuous tangle of moss posing as a mandala, burning the sudden white tiny cracks in between, outside. And uh, this is a sort of a longer kind of serial poem. Um, it has very much to do with uh, the California coast um, where I lived until around, till the year 2017. And moved, then I moved back to Washington. Um, this is called Microtonal Concert Tape. The balcony is cut swiftly, falls as a drawbridge, a secret two-story harp exposed, mangled, marimba eroica, cold fog. I lay my hands on silver strings. It's no secret, I form my own instruments. An oval shimmering kingdom, light limestone green, wires for the sharp rain-like turn in a song that leaves impressions, dotted furies, locks impounded, lined paper, pelican inks repeat. Ousted galaxy, headlong rush revolving the blood, placing clear agates up against the ledge, liquid forms worship empty skies. His voice steps over the running of the bath, knocking of the shade in the next room. His reading holds a jagged sense he may not make it. He clatters on in brokenness as if he were hiking in ascension, citing certain medicine words in order. Moonscape in reverse, scattered rocks cutting up and away from the waves. Six descending tones, Mustard, bleached gold, flamingo, Mars red, burnt orange, bleeding cove, dry underneath, a torch to lick the walls, a singer to catch the song. Read Indian oratory deep in the night and cut it all up. Looking glass is dead. The circular blue paper is the sky. In Joanne Kiger's poems, the ground is formed from last night's dream. The thick Tibetan rope is piled like a snake. A young fruit tree shades the long plank bench. An agate sits as a stopper in a glass bottle. The wind is in the light of the sun. The tide forms an inlet cutting off a small boat anchored beside timid lovers. 
The ends of clouds have spiral lines like scrolls, Japanese woodcuts of waves spilling over. A lone hummingbird sits on the limb where there used to be two. The poplars grow past a red circular sun, dense lines quilted behind it, frozen in light. A postcard cut tall and thin. The footprints are traced beyond the cliffs. Long stories are meant for empty containers. The wood pile is arranged upside down, wisps of cold web-like grass underneath. The black branches hang down and narrow to purple leaves dividing the page. One cloud forms a low solid ceiling over the Pacific. Two blue jays swerve out against another sky. One paved ring white around East Peak. Watch the butterflies drop off away. We visit now more than we did when I couldn't drive myself up to see you. The lilt in drifters at night, their distortion like embalming of shooting light turned figures. And soon I couldn't recognize distortions at all. Their closet inward radiance and carryover was how I lived, how the coast is not my dream jagged line, but a living massacre around continuous ocean view, all the way asking of reflection. Again, suspension in sound means circling, chasing down, scaring off old edges. The remnants of a lovely party strung out, sensitive, dark-eyed woodcuts in love. Young and old, candlelit tombs, casting down planks through the darkness, crossing canals toward the shaded corners of the house. And this is called Cold Valley. The fog shades a smooth stone bust, then slips into rain. My mind is well suited, onyx shining edges, the reflection itself. Traces of mist on an old window. The best part is grinding the ink down endlessly, filling my brush. Gray morning, I first feel the mind as reflex. Bright and clear, the end of Evergreen Road is closed and crumbling away. Bill McNeil's red poppy resolves to be eaten alive, exposed to a shaft of air between the flower and its flat glass, masterful. The black bleeds out from his beak. In long tears, ink onto sopping head feathers, slicked back, black stitches on yellow, powdered eyes aglow, white speckles thrown onto autumn breast feathers, a white field below. Mirror box dissolved. One, balance of the onrush, its drama, one of silence over sound, of being skirted in passage with priests behind doors, color and cut gold, a clouded cistern, jackal bounding about the pines between reeds, my guardians overjoyed, driving off the clouds into cities. The chariot doubles back in two parts, a wing to pump to slow the air, a city aloft for the birds most grand, set apart, adrift, fountain-stamped dome at the center. Two. Long tones sweating the ice-locked sutras, arriving inside of stations, verses toppling out stranded, a river scene beside, the wires left crackling pools in razor crosses of birds. The clutch is worn, fallen back, golden grasses striking blue silk. First Love for Kevin Opstadel. I've never lived in New York, but I died there once while visiting. Those empty riverbed organ blues whose chords I never knew. 
If the poems are dated, surely she is charting a breakthrough. Large black butterflies like birds, and the sun is a star, a form of trust plus reintroduction to the act. Dead heat and playing it off, killing time in Islam Mujeres, of quickly drawn and dispelled passage, the shadow of the board behind the door. I signed once as Miss Crane, once as Miss Valdez, jerked awake, the Atlantic Ocean had died and folded, headlong, disappeared. Thank you. Joanne Krieger, and what, what is the title of your chat book again? It's titled On the Way, but I did, I edited a whole book about Joanne uh, for Wave Books, and that book is called There You Are, um, Interviews, Journals, and Ephemera, and that was published in 2017. Speaking of editing, I just wanted to, to um, add that Cedar was the contributing editor for the, the section in the, of, on the Pacific Northwest in this wonderful collection. I hope you can see it. It just came out this past year. And uh, yeah. when the light of the world was subdued, our songs came through. It was edited by Joy Harjo. Right. Yeah, it's right here. Woo. Yep. There we go. Joy and <laughs> And it's a wonderful collection. So, you know, when did you first fall in love with the natural world? And is there a writer that helped you as well? I think that my first moment where I was conscious that I was where I was supposed to be in the 70s, we moved to Vashon Island and rented a cabin down a trail on, um, on Dolphin Point. And the tide would go out twice a day and the tide would come back in twice a day. And I had babies and I was teaching and it was so wonderful. The smell and the sound, the color and the light. Um, the light really didn't shine on our house till a month before Easter. But anyway, it was it was just wonderful. And the book and the writer, I'll do this quickly, the book and the writer, um, not a poet, but the book is by Muriel Guberle or Guberlet, and it is Seaweeds at Ebb Tide. Um, when I was getting ready for this, I, I was thinking, well, what are my poems doing? You know, what am I doing? And there's poems that are just descriptive, and there's poems that are are descriptive of the of the the animal, the plant, or or the landscape. And then there's poems like the first one I read that go through the landscape and then work to earn a comment. Like why are we looking so closely? We're destroying the berry and the next generation of whatever plant animals in that berry. A poet would be Robert Sund, and it's not so Robert was a wonderful human being. But I don't write anything like him, but I can read one of his poems and it puts me beyond science, beyond description, but into a place of, I might as well be a clam in a hole. It's so wonderful. Who would like to respond next? I guess I fell in love with um, sort of the nature around here because I always just loved the darkness so much. And being a Suquamish person, um, you end up learning a lot about old man house and how to survive off the landscape. You know, how did people survive? Just answering that question triggered so much in my imagination, even as a young person. And I didn't really figure out what those answers were until I got older and sort of educated myself um, or asked my dad questions he was willing to answer or my sister, Lydia. So I guess that's... Um, sort of the way the landscapes of this area and eventually California being in the shadow of Mount Tamalpais, that definitely affected my imagination as well. Um, but I wanted to mention too, for the writerly part of the question, to mention two nature writers uh, that I love. Uh, Larry Eigner is one um, who is a poet who is confined to a wheelchair and he spent a lot of his early uh, life in Massachusetts. So in front of, you know, outside, but also in front of a window. Um, and so a lot of his poetry is sort of like that. Anything that enters into um, the realm of the window or the front yard or what he can literally see sort of composes the ecosystem in that poetry. But also the poetry of James Schuyler and the nature poetry that occurs by great writers within cities, you know. <laughs> Um, there's no better description of the night sky or uh, flowers in gardens in cities um, than James Schuyler. 
uh, one of the great poets who wrote uh, Morning of the Poem was probably his most famous book, but they're all great. And also the poet Michael McClure, who got, uh, who would deal with things on almost a, a cellular level. <laughs> you know, he could, uh, the, the poem is a physical body. And when you are performing it to give it that thrust, to give it that physicality. Good, thank you. Thank you. You're giving us a great reading list. And Rob, how about you? Yeah, um, so I, I was lucky. I grew up um, somewhat close to nature. I grew up in Illinois. We had the, um, the woods. They were just called the woods, um, county land, I think, or the lagoons. We called them lagoons. So that allowed me to get out in nature. And I think that's when my environmental thinking started. I, I remember um, we were assigned little writing and you know, exercises in our second grade class. And I wrote a story about the end of the world. <laughs> you know, so I was already seeing what was going on. And I think that was my first adult consciousness was to take note of that injustice between humans and non-humans. Um, that really struck me. Uh, I, I didn't start writing poetry until my 30s. And really the big, um, what really kicked it all off was uh, when I started painting houses and uh, I suddenly was looking at the world in a much more detailed and granular level. Uh, I was noticing surfaces uh, because I was getting into doing wall finishes. It was called faux at the time. Everybody was doing faux finishing and it's kind of tacky. There's better ways to do it with like, you know, real clay and lime and stuff. But um, I just started noticing services, like um, if you're sanding down some trim, you're just astounded at the patterns that appear under your sandpaper. Um, or weathered paint, I realized was particularly beautiful. So I, I began to notice what um, nature does to surfaces and that just kind of opened my eyes, um, excuse the pun. Um, and I, that's when I started uh, writing poetry. Um, when I wish I had more people to talk about, um, you know, I I was turned on to poetry by Carl Sandburg, uh, by Walt Whitman. Um, I was in Port Angeles at the time, and my mother had I was staying with my mother for a little while, helping paint her house. And uh, she just had all these old classics, you know, these hardbound classics. And I just started reading them. And uh, that's when I kind of started falling in love with poetry. Good. Thank you. Um, Linda, do you have a question you want to ask our poets? Well, so, um, I was just wondering, somebody said at one point that they thought that um, most nature poetry is kind of written out of impulse of nostalgia. And I wonder if anybody could, has a, something to, to say about that response to that. I once worked with a landscape designer. I mean, Sojourner Smith, and she would never put a title on herself being a good Vashon woman. But what she would do when someone would say, come and help me Sojourner, this, my, my, yard, my, my yard wants to or is what it was. And she said, look back to your childhood. Mm. What garden do you remember from your childhood? And I bet you, just like the pioneer women that came over would bring roses mm -hmm. from their gardens back east to the Northwest. And one way they kept them alive was to stick them in a potato. Mm -hmm. And the, the energy in the potato would last the, the, the season oh. to come over. Uh, the idea of nostalgia uh, in nature writing is a little sad to me because it talks a little bit about how much we're losing. Mm -hmm. um, and there is this kind of uh, idea of what's nature and what's not nature. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't find that helpful. Um, there's nothing that isn't nature. Uh, it's just nature changed by us. Yeah, nostalgia is actually something that I try to, to avoid. Yeah, I mean, I kind of am on that 
same tip because that's why I mentioned the fact that Joanne dated everything that she wrote. Um, because I think, you know, being on the pulse of the present moment is really what being, uh, you know, ecologically minded is really all about, you know, no matter how devastating the news is. I'd, I'd like to add to it because, because what I'm, what I worry about as species disappear and the landscape or familiar disappears. So nostalgia can have a, a usually a negative. I'll think about it sort of positively. Um, Rachel Carson said, one way to open your eyes is to ask yourself, what if I had never seen this before? What if I knew I would never see it again? Mm. Uh. And and to me as 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 a poet, it's like, oh no. We have something nature like bear. What if we never see a bear again? What if our children never see a bear? What happens to the symbol of bear within poetry? They will with when you read bear in a poem, you would not see baby bears, you wouldn't smell a bear, you wouldn't hear a bear, um, you wouldn't fear anything. Uh, you you wouldn't know what it was like to look at a piece of scat and take it apart and say, ooh, this is what this bear is eating. It must be Mount Rainier and it must be um, huckleberries. So what, what I worry is that as a poet, when you put any word in from nature, we're assuming that everybody's seen a bear or smelled a bear, or has, or has heard a myth about a bear, or has feared a bear, or listened to bear stories around the fire. But once bear disappears, what happens to our poetry now, but what happens to that image? Anyway. And that's a great question, Anne. It reminds me of the, I, you probably, some of you were aware, I, I was maybe 10 years ago, eight to 10 years ago, that the Oxford English Dictionary for kids eliminated a number of words, um, oh. natural history words like blackberry, the, the fruit oh. blackberry and replaced it with the technology blackberry. Oh. And there were some amazing <laughs> <things>. <laughs> And it was very sad that this happened, but you know, the poets responded and there were some amazing poems written in response to that, taking all of these, you know, all the words for like, um, I can't, they're just escaping me now other than the, the kind of humorous one about the blackberry, but all those wonderful words that, is, that describe the land that are really no longer part of our vocabulary now. So that's what, that's what that reminded me of. And I see that we do have a question. Um, thank you, Paul Nelson. A question for Cedar. Cedar, do you think poets like Joanne Kiger, whose work is very subtle, gets looked over as an eco-poet because of that? Um, no, I think she's sort of, in a, in a certain way, I think her work gets over-determined as nature poetry uh, because of her association with Gary, rather than Buddhist poetry, which it really is. And, and it allows the day to unfold and, and sort of the chance encounters of the animals that inhabit your front lawn, you know, those things enter the picture. And um, I just feel like she kind of draws a very gentle boundary for the poem and then things enter into it and she doesn't add more than she needs to. Um, but I think, you know, um, but the other half of that saying that she is overlooked, absolutely, you know, she's overlooked. Like the best writers of the so-called sort of beat generation are all women, they're all queer, they're, uh, they're all people of color. I mean, my opinion, Diane De Prima, Joanne Kiger, uh, Bob Kaufman, um, you know, all these people, the most interesting lives, you know, were not those of Jack Kerouac, Allen Ginsberg, people that people know in that tradition are the people that struggled, you know, the people that barely survived or, you know, in some cases were wrecked by the scene. But, um, but yeah, so I definitely feel that, that she is... Um, you know, but she hated to be described as underappreciated too or undersung because she was so happy living out in the shadow of Mount Tam. Um, but I would say um, in my in the in the book of lectures um, that Wave just put out, there's a long one about Joanne. So we're trying to reverse that neglect. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. We will look forward to that book, Cedar. You certainly piqued my interest. Um, 
you know, one more question and then I'm not seeing more questions, but please put them in the chat. Um, I'd like to get come back to something that Rob said in his, um, in his reading when he was reading from his essay. And I guess it's, it's just the relationship between science and poetry and that sense of compartmentalization. Um, I guess I wonder a little bit if you think that's changing and if it's not, what can we do to change it more? Maybe as educators, as parents, as writers, how do we bring those two kind of disparate worlds together? Um, I do think science is changing tremendously. When we use the term science, what are we saying? You know, I mean, um, Somebody mentioned uh, braiding sweetgrass, mm -hmm. um, which is a, a book that takes science in a Native American direction. Um, and indigenous people have been doing science for tens of thousands of years. Uh, it's just without um, all the theory, you know, it's just, it's embedded in a wholly different uh, cosmology. So I think, you know, one thing we we need to do with science is is be more precise when we talk about science. And I think we need to challenge science. I mean, a lot of us are getting challenged right now uh, to look at where we come from and to look at the baggage we brought along. And it's time to examine that baggage and deal with it. Uh, I think everybody agrees on that. Uh, and I think the same is true for science. I mean, science is still carrying uh, cogito ergo sum, you know, I think therefore I am, um, you know, Descartes thing, which is almost nonsensical. I, I really don't know what that means other than thought is the only thing he can trust. He's that disconnected from nature and, and that, you know, presaged the um, science as user and controller of nature. Uh, but, you know, you look at uh, Robin you know, while Kimmer and uh, new scientists, and they are coming at it from a totally different viewpoint. So it's a really, it's a, it's an exciting time for science. And I think uh, as science progresses, it's starting to look more like poetry. And uh, I think poets, uh, this is something I've done myself over the last couple of years, is really dive into science and try to learn it, try to learn the climate science, try to learn how ecosystems work, soil, uh, it's really, uh, it's uh, incredibly generative for poetry because you uh, get, as Paul would say, Paul Nelson, you get the glimmering details. You, you, you're, you're exposed to so many things that you were looking at but didn't see before. But once you really take it apart, you know, you, you have so much material to work with. Thank you for mentioning Robin Wall Kimmer because she's such a great example of bringing together Western knowledge with indigenous knowledge. And I think I saw lots of heads nodding and people holding up their copies of her book. And, <laughs> you know, braiding sweetgrass and gathering moss has also really- I wanna wonderful. get that. Yeah, yeah. But there's a couple other book um, books that have been mentioned that I, um, I was trying to remember the title for it. Um, Patrick Johnson mentioned Home Ground Homeground, I think, was edited by Barry Lopez and Deborah Gwartney, and it talks about all of the language, where it comes from, you know, that related to our um, geography. And then um, Susan Landgraf, thank you, Susan, mentioned The Lost Words by Robert, Mc Robert McFarlane and Jackie Morris, which just came out this year, I think, and they take those lost words and make art out of them. Um, and that's a really powerful book. And I believe that the Northwind Art is planning to do an exhibit connected to that book. I don't know more details, but um, if you keep an eye on their website, I think you can find out. Um, so I'm just looking at the time and realizing we probably need to move towards our closing. There, Holly, there was one other question. It's kind of a big question, <laughs> you know, we could maybe take shortly, but from Carl, who says, earlier this evening, I was watching a PBS special about Greta Thunberg and her attempts to get the rest of the world to wake up to the awful situation we are faced with climate change. How do we use poetry to engage the public to act boldly with regards to the environment? Big question. Big question. 
Great question. Great yeah. Question. Yes. <laughs> So who wants to take that on? <laughs> Come on, Rob. <laughs> well, the, the key to your statement is use poetry. And uh, you know, that's complicated. Um, when you try to use poetry, you, you start to lose the poetry. So, um, you know, I, I sometimes think we need to just start a, a little more basically and just try to get as educated as we can. And... Um, and maybe insist on a new language, um, a less a less uh, scientific, uh, a less sterile language, a less objectifying language, and start to insist that we start calling things by their names, and and uh, as many people are doing now, calling them who, you know, rather than it's, you know, uh, treating the non-human uh, in language as our equals as our brothers and sisters, as our relatives. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a little skeptical that we can throw poems at it, you know. Um, but I do think we can, as poets, call out bad language and, and weak thinking and shallow thinking and mechanical thinking. Um, and at a certain point, just become activists. You know, some po at some point, you, if you really want to change things, you just become an activist. You know, you, you're, you, you can't ask poetry to do things that maybe it doesn't want to do all the time. Right. The poet, the poem comes to you and you can't just tell it to, like, serve my purpose here to stop global warming. It, that's <laughs> right. That's been my experience. It doesn't work. <laughs> so yeah. maybe humility. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to see the poet as a label disappear and have everybody write poetry and not take it upon us as the poets to decide what's poetry, what it should sound like, what culture mm -hmm. it should reflect, mm -hmm. and honor the fact that human beings, because they can speak or not speak and, and, and think, can take what they see and challenges them and the landscape and write about it. I do the poetry post and there was Mormon dudes walking around in their suits all summer. And they would put out these, they would put these great big paragraphs on my poetry post or the poetry post. And I finally caught them and I said, you know, you guys go home, take that lady's um, paragraphs, take one paragraph, break it into lines and make it look like a poem. <laughs> And then, and and uh, I'm hot for that. Thank you. That's a great story, Anne. Cedar, did you have something you wanted to yeah, say? Yeah, just uh, just off of what Anne was saying, like how do you? That's the question, really, is how do you take poetry off the page into and make it turn your life into a reality made of poetry? So poetry isn't something you're stepping in and out of. Yes, you know. Um, it's not something that, you know, that's all I do, you know, but I worked 20 years to be able to, I worked 20 years of terrible jobs to be able to just deal in poetry now. So I don't think I dwell elsewhere. I mean, I bring the strategies of rhythm and the strategies of, um, study and just all of the, the strategies I would bring to a poem, you know, those are brought. Also, those you also bring those for when you're just thinking about something, how to approach a subject. That's what poetry does for you. It's, you know, you it's a construct of mind that you you have to, you know, you can get rusty in a matter of weeks. So you're always like feeding the machine. I mean, that's I'm a poet and an activist. Those are just one body. They're just energies in a body, you know. So mm -hmm. I don't see division, you know, with the page and the poet and all that. That's great. And maybe that's a nice note to end on. I love that. A reality made of poetry. <laughs> and and um, Paul yeah. Nelson wrote poetic, poetics as cos cosmology. So. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And, yep. and yep. Paul's picking up the idea of the American sentence as appropriate <laughs> for poetry. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. That's right. That's right. Yes. 
Good. Well, let's conclude with a poem from each of you. So um, let's go in the same order. So, Rob, do you want to? Okay. Yeah, I just have a, a very short poem. Uh, it's about this dialogue in my head of uh, uh, being an activist for really long and writing lots of activist poetry and then hitting a wall and feeling like I wasn't creative anymore. So there's a conversation I'm having with nature and it's nature, my voice and nature's voice and nature's voice is a little, I think, higher and a little more feminine. Mm -hmm. Perhaps I have to walk away for a while. Would you walk away? The freedom of the lyric is the first thing. I have to maintain it. All lyric comes from my breath. But I need to find my own. It needs to flow freely wherever it wants to go. I only flow freely. It can't always be about you. It's depressing, boring. I got to write about something new. About, about. You are awfully concerned with this thing about. By the way, you are going to walk somewhere. You called it away. Where's that? Mm. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Anne, how about you? Okay. Um, I started my household um, right at the edge of um, of when the Northwest had the abundance where you could go out and get too many clams, have too many cucumbers. And now I find myself going to Costco to get too much. And so I'm going to go oh. back and to back cut about the... the um, Husband and wife, post World War II, at the another at the edge of um, of abundance, and they live in an area where one of the history books is called "They Tried to Cut It All" mm. in Grays Harbor. I'd like to return to back cut my cycle of poems that present a husband and wife through monologues. They are living post World War II on the Washington coast. They lived where the landscape gave them too much to bring back to the kitchen. I go to Costco to get the same challenge. Putting up for winter, the glut. We net smelt out of the waves long run. Eagle snag silver scattering crazy. Salmon so plentiful, their splishes racket upstream. Bear smell hot at every trail turn. So thick, huckleberry milk from the stem, plunk, plunk in our buckets, fresh scat, purple with fruit. So much we cannot stop. Heavy loads, just one more. Wood stove glowing into the night. Horse clams, dozens jarred up erect. Apple slices strung on grocery string, zigzag across the room. So much, steam, heat, and smoke, days, nights filled with doing, one by one, too much. Oh, thank God, hunger. Yeah. Beautiful. Okay, uh, thank you, Anne and Rob. Uh, I'm going to end with a poem um, titled, What Did You Learn Here? Old Man House for Joy Harjo. How to fall asleep easily on the beach, to dig clams, to dream a net made of nettles, a medicine of marsh tea boiled out to the open air, a memory of cedar bark coiled, resting for months in cold water, to be fashioned into our so-called lifestyle, clothes for ceremony as well as our dailiness, canoe bailers, diapers, we used the wood for our half-mile longhouse and totems, Dried fish, a hard smoke, wooden oval plates that hooked together, filled with clear oil of salmon, to wet our palates and smooth our bodies. A shawl of woolly dog, now extinct, they were bred on tiny islands we can still identify, Tatouche Island off of Cape Flattery, where there were whaling tribes too, the Macaw, one of whose villages collapsed, preserved in silt, later unearthed, and how else, which other ceremonies or necessary edges of objects? 
our ivory needles, otter pelts, mat creasers, our dances. What else do you remember dreaming of? A kind of rake to skim the waves, to catch tiny fish on rows of twisted nails. Thank you. Oh, beautiful, beautiful, Cedar. Thank you. So it's up to me, I guess, to close. So thank you so much, Rob and Anne and Cedar for the night. It's, I wish we could go on and on. It's such a beautiful gathering. And I'm just kind of looking at some of the comments and uh, it's really, you've, you've blessed us tonight. Thank you so much. Um, and we look for, I look forward to reading more of your work. Um, and I wanted to thank Centrum, George and Centrum and Northwind Arts for continuing to support our reading series and we'll keep bringing poetry to our community and beyond. Um, and thanks for everyone who came and listened tonight and to celebrate poetry and to celebrate Earth Day and the Earth and um, continue to take care of each other and this place, this big place that we call home. Um, wanted to mention that our next reading, which will be May 20th at 7 p.m. with Kelly Russell Agadon and Susan Langgraf. So we'll look forward to that. And I hope we'll see many of you back here and uh, to listen to their new work and, and to gather in love of the language and of each other. So thank you. Good night, everyone. Be well. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Lovely Wonderful evening. Reading. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Cedar. Thank you, Holly. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Ann. Thank you, Cedar. Thanks.